Even last week we started a message. What was the title of the message? Running on, e. Running on E. I had a few people text me and said, you never finished the message, you left me on E. And um, <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. It was just, um, it was a longer message and, and um, so we kind of stopped it halfway. So today I know we have some guests, people that are here for the first time. I will not be able to cover everything I covered last week. That would be impossible. But I am gonna give you a quick overview of what the message is about and some of the points. And so media teams, stay with me here. And then we'll transition to God's remedy for getting out of E. All right, how many are ready for that one? Yeah. And so um, here we go, let's, let's get going. First of all, last week we talked about what running on E meant. Every single one of us, whether now, whether we have been, or we possibly will be in the future, we're gonna reach a point of exhaustion. We're gonna reach a point of physical exhaustion, mental exhaustion, spiritual exhaustion, relationships, and we get to a place where we feel like we're running on fumes, we're about to break, we're running on E. It feels like the weight of the world is upon our shoulders and we have no idea how we're gonna make it past today. You go to sleep, put the blanket over yourself and when the alarm clock sounds, you do not wanna remove the blanket. You wanna stay under that the rest of the day. How many have been there? Man, yeah, I've, I've been there too, absolutely. And so the story we learned from, we can glean from, was in 1 Kings chapter 19, where we were talking about Elijah and some of the things that he went through and how he began to run on E in a moment in his life and what God's instructions were to him to help him get out of that place of exhaustion. And I wanna be clear, I put this message together because as a church, we are there for the most part, many of us. I asked last week, who is there? And about 80% raised their hand. We had a Timothy team meeting this past Wednesday. I came prepared to teach on covenant service and I'm ready to start teaching. And right before I started, I paused for a moment. I asked one question and the whole entire discipleship program turned into an hour and a half of tears, worship and ministry because every single person confessed they're running on E. And so what you're going through, you're not alone. Many others are as well. But the good thing is that God knows, but not just does he know, God cares. And God has provided a way out for all of us today. But in the story of Elijah, we know that Elijah was in Mount Carmel. Before that was the whole Elijah story. Remember the fist in heaven? What was that about? Good job. Good job, prayer pastor. Um, rain, he said he saw like a cloud forming like a little fist. It was in a time of drought and rain began to fall. He got, saw God move supernaturally. Then later on was the showdown at Mount Carmel. Remember that? He called all the prophets. He called the king. He called everybody up there. He's like, let's see whose God is God. And they began to uh, call out to their false gods. They began to cut themselves and do all kind of rituals. And... Um, and then later Elijah says, okay, let, let, let's, let, let me show you how it's done. And the crazy thing about the whole scenario, it wasn't just that he was calling fire from heaven. It was the fact that he told people to pour water all over the altar. What was the issue? One of the issues was they were in a major drought. So he told them to get the very thing they lacked and pour it on the altar. That's all another preaching. It's good stuff. And they pour it on the altar and he calls fire from heaven and fire comes from heaven, consumes the sacrifice in Israel that was separated from God. They had destroyed the altar of God. They were serving pagan gods at that moment they begin to return to the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob what a monumental what a powerful experience can you believe that can you imagine that's you right you're preaching the word of God and the fire comes from heaven I mean you'll be stoked you'll be on fire no pun intended for God for the rest of your life I mean you just saw God do miraculous things but don't we we see God do miraculous things. We see God heal. We see God restore. We see God do supernatural things. And then we're amen, amen, amen. And then a week and two weeks later, you, we find ourselves in places in which we're doubting. We find ourselves in places in which we're running on E. We find ourselves in places in which, you guys catch what I'm saying, right? And so all of us have been there. And I love the fact that God leaves the story of Elijah and also the Psalms. Because you're going to find some crazy things in the Psalms with David. That he leaves those stories in there to show us that these people, though they did amazing things, they were human. And they struggled just the way we struggled and they went through things the way we go through. So Elijah finds himself running from whom? Ahab and Jezebel, very good. He's running away from them because she said she wants to take his life. I mean, that's what a messenger told him. And so he is now running for his life. So after God moves supernaturally, he's running for his life. He's running on E, he's exhausted. And then we talked about some of the things in scripture last week that are byproducts of that breaking point, are byproducts of that emotional, physical, and spiritual exhaustion. And one of them was when we're there, we began to diminish our value. Remember we talked about that? We began to think we're not good enough. We began to put ourselves down mentally. 
And when you start doing that, it's a possibility you're now running on E. And the scripture for that was 1 Kings 19, verse 4 on the screen. 1 Kings 19, 4. There it is. It says, Elijah came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed, Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. You guys catch, catch that? So he begins to compare himself to the ancestors, all those that have gone before. And, and that's one of the causes of diminished worth and value. We start comparing ourselves to other people. We started talking about that last week. But they're not going through this. Look how awesome and powerful man and woman of God they are. Oh, they're always smiling. Everything is good. Everything they touch prospers. And then we begin to diminish our own worth. We begin to diminish our own value in God's eyes. I know I'm not the only one who's done that. And so we begin to question our talents, we begin to question our giftings, we compare our problems to other people's problems or lack of success to their apparent success. We see them posting pictures online, oh my God, look at them, they're so happy. And then we begin to diminish our value. You ready, Erica? I saw you can't creep up on me. This is our media team. Give it up for our media team, uh, part of the media team. And so she's taking pictures for the website. You ready for a good one? All right, here you go. Hurry up, hurry up. Is that good? Are you ever going to catch me from that side or no? Yeah, you should. You should go that side. All right, here we go. I'm just, just never mind, guys. Keep on going. I just do it to bother her, really. All right, and so, so that's what happens when we're running on E. We begin to diminish our own, I'm a bad father. I'm a bad mother. I'm not worth anything to my kids. I'm a horrible employee. We begin to diminish our own worth. We do that. When you've gotten to that place, you're probably at the brink of breaking. You're burning out. Number two, we underestimate our effort. We underestimate our effort. First King 19, 19, I have worked very hard for the Lord of the heavens, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you and have torn down the altars. Like, man, I've done all you have called me to do, God. I've preached your gospel. I've declared the truth. I have worked very, very, very hard for you, but nothing is working. It doesn't matter. The people are not responding. How many feel that way? You just work really hard and hard and hard, and you give it everything you got, lack of sleep. You don't have much energy left. You're running on fumes, and you feel like, man, my, all my work is for nothing. It's not really producing much results. We can get that way. And one of the causes is because we, we underestimate our work because we also, I talked about last week, because somehow, somewhere, we believe that, the res, that other people's response is our responsibility. We believe that everything else should be under our control, and we can't control everything. Remember, it's the Atlas effect, the big globe on our shoulder. And when we begin to do that, we begin to undermine our own efforts and work. And I told somebody in the lobby earlier, and I've said it before, faithfulness is our responsibility. The results is God's. We just have to continue to be faithful. Faithful, faithful. We cannot be responsible for everything that happens and every lack of response or response. You're setting yourself up for complete exhaustion when you make yourself the general manager of the entire universe. Everything falls on me. Be careful. All right? Let's go to the third one was, we begin to magnify our problems. We've all been there as well. We overemphasize what is wrong in our life and we ignore all that is right and all the blessings that we have. We focus on the negatives of our life. We always see the cup half full versus seeing it half empty versus it being half full. We begin to magnify the molehill turns into an absolute mountain. It turns into a mountain. First King 19.10. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. That's what he was saying, and that was a lie. It wasn't true. There were 7,000 people that were not bowing their knees before the revival, and there was a whole lot more after the revival that were serving God. But in the middle of what he was going through, he felt like he was the only one left. He began to magnify his situation and his problem. He began to respond emotionally. It's called emotional reasoning versus through truth. We get to that place, we're exhausted, so we're emotional. So everything we see comes from the perspective of our fatigued, tired emotion. And so we magnify every situation in our life. Does it happen to you sometimes? It's like you're going through a tough day, but somehow, some way, you think it's just a tough life. Right? It's just a bad moment. It's a bad day, possibly a bad two or three days. But we go through that, we think to ourselves, it's just a tough life in general. Because we magnify those moments in our life and we see everything through that pain, through that frustration, and through that struggle. And when you do that, you're beginning to burn out. You're running on E. You're running on E. We need a new perspective. We need God's perspective, which we'll get into in just a second. All right? And so, by the way, it's called emotional reasoning when we do that. That's the actual terminology for emotional 
reasoning. In moments of weariness and fatigue, we overemphasize our struggles and we underplay the blessings because we see everything through our emotions. All right? And I'm flying through these guys. I know this last week. The fourth one, we abandon our vision. We just give up. You eventually get to a place where you just give up. You throw in the towel. You abandon your task. You abandon our vision. You can't see past the moment. So you abandon it all and you throw it all up in the air. First Kings 9.4, Elijah went through it. He came to a broom bush, sat down under and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. I am done. Maybe some of you have felt that way. Man, I am done. I'm done with everything. I'm done with that, with that woman. I'm done with that man you gave me, Lord, Lord. I'm done with these kids. I'm done with Impact Church. I'm done being part of this ministry. I'm done with this job. I can't stand this job. While people are looking for him. I'm done with everything. We get to that point sometimes where we just want to throw in the towel. We want to pull away because we are fatigued. If that's you, you have entered into a moment of fatigue. Emotional fatigue, spiritual fatigue, physical fatigue. But I have good news. God wants to renew your focus. God wants to change it all around. And God hears your cry. God knows what you're experiencing. And God gives you ways in which you can get out of the place you're in. And it happened in the life of Elijah. There's somebody right now watching online. I know you are. Who called me this past week and said, all right, I'm sorry. I'm going to get ahead of you. I'm going to read the story because I want to find out how to get out of this. And so this person began to read it. He called me back. He says, I can't find it. I'm looking at it. I can't find it. So today we're going to break it down. It's there. God did it in steps and in processes. Are you ready? All right, so let's see what God does to help us refill our tank. Here we go. Number one, this is what God tells us on the screen. It's a shocker. Rest your body. And, and, and I'm not being sarcastic, but for many who are in ministry, that's like a cuss word to us. Because somehow, somewhere we were taught that if you're a Christian and you're in ministry, sleep is a waste of time. And you got to just go, 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 go. That's not biblical. The Bible doesn't teach that. Jesus didn't teach that. God the Father didn't teach that in the Old Testament. And so we got to be careful with this go, go, go mentality, especially us. We live in South Florida, Miami. It's hustle and bustle here. It's nonstop here. I can't start a meeting until about 8 o'clock because by the time you get out of work and make it here, it's just, it's just crazy living here. So it's important that we prioritize our weeks in our life and we find rest and we rest our body. Now, the resting of the body, this is God's remedy for physical exhaustion. Remember this, physical, emotional, spiritual. This is God's remedy for physical exhaustion exhaustion what happened with Elijah Elijah voices complaint and what did God do he's like take my life I'm no better than my ancestors I've had enough and God's like go to sleep God tells him to lie down he lies down and then he wakes him up hey wake up and then he sees some bread warm over a fire and he sees a jar of water and he says hey go eat now he goes and he eats and he, and he drinks water, he eats. And then God said, now go full force. No. What did God tell him? Hey, good. Go lie back down again. He lied back down again. He got some rest. He got some sleep. Then the angel of the Lord taps him again. All right, get up. Let's go get some water. Let's get something to eat. You see the process? You see what God didn't do? God didn't say, the word of the Lord says, you're more than a conquering Christ Jesus. We have all the best intentions sometimes, don't we? When people are physically fatigued they're not sleeping they're exhausted they're at their breaking point just keep going you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus we just know all these verses and we want to throw them out we want to be helpful we're not helping what they need is physical rest they actually got to get some sleep there are people that do not sleep averaging four hours five hours a day and you're not resting. You can do that for a day or two, but after some time, you will burn out. You will run on E. And if your sleep is out of order, everything else, emotional, spiritual, is going to be affected. You got to get yourself some rest. So God's first remedy was go to sleep. You're tired. You're exhausted. You've been doing ministry for quite some time. You've been doing my work. Now go to sleep and get some rest and eat. I love this about God. God didn't give him a lecture. Man up. I'm tired of hearing that. People are going through stuff, hey, man up. I don't know what some of us say joking around, but if people are really going through some stuff, hey, woman up, man up. No, get some sleep. You're tired. He didn't say, man, come on, get a life. Come on, Elijah. He didn't scold him. He didn't rebuke him. He didn't say, but remember what I did just two or three days ago? Like, have some faith, brother. 
No, he said, go to rest. Get some rest. Get some sleep. He didn't say, suck it up, buttercup. Pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. You're a man. Get rid of that emotion. Get rid of that mood. Get rid of that attitude. Get rid of... No. Go to sleep. He didn't preach. He didn't yell at him. God just told him to rest. Psalms 127 verse 2, it says, God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. Now, there's a difference between proper rest and sleeping all day. Those are two different things. Get the rest you need to function at an effective high capacity, right? You don't need 15 hours. No, that's depression. Or probably another health issue. Get what you need and move forward. But get what you need. Johnny, get what you need. I'm preaching to myself because I am exhausted right now. Are you telling me I walked in today? I don't know how to take it, whether people love me or not. You're like, I walk in, hey, you look, you look sleepy, you look horrible. I'm not sure. I'm, sure. I'm sure they got every good intention, you know what I'm saying? But um, yes, yes, definitely. I need some sleep. I will get my rest. On the screen, when we're exhausted, sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do is rest. Rest, rest, rest. If you wake up every morning and you don't feel refreshed and you feel exhausted and you're yawning and it's only 12 o'clock, you're probably not getting enough sleep. You got to get your rest. Some of the th we have to reprioritize our week. Like, I love the fact, I love people and I love hanging out. I know you do too, but sometimes stop hanging out. Yeah. I hear people say, I don't have any time, but you're always hanging out with people. I don't get Stop hanging out. Get some sleep. Turn off the television. Get some sleep and rest, even if it's a nap. What is a nap, by the way, Andrea? Do you know how long a nap is? Because I always, I grew up thinking it was 15, 30 minutes. I'm now hearing it's about an hour. It's about an hour? Wow, so it's changed. Times have changed. Just get what you need. Just get what you need. This is sleep deprivation. By the way, over 70 million Americans today are living with sleep deprivation is the actual study. Over 70 million sleep, dep complete sleep deprivation. Not a bad night, sleep deprivation. And when you're deprived of sleep, that is the number one cause of fatigue. You'll live your life with no, low energy, excessive sleepiness, emotional instability. Everything begins to change when you don't get your sleep. It's actually one of the number one causes of mood disorders is lack of sleep. Now, if your spouse has mood disorders, don't look at them and say, hey, you got to sleep, you got bad mood. Don't do that. Don't do that. But you got to get your rest. You got to get your sleep. It affects our ability to remember. It affects our short-term memory. So imagine if it affects your memory, there's no reason we live off emotional reasoning. We have no memory of the Word of God. We can't even recollect. I mean, I've been there before. I want to quote the Scripture. I'm like, I can't think of anything. I'm sitting in front of an iPad. I'm like, I can't remember the Scripture. I'm just fatigued. I'm tired. We got to get some sleep. We got to get some sleep. When you're tired, you can't handle a whole lot. Trust me. Sometimes one good night's sleep, one good day of rest changes our perspective overnight. Have you been completely overwhelmed today? And then you get some good rest and tomorrow you can deal with that in a whole different way? Your perspective is, is just one good night of sleep, getting some good rests. I love Psalms 23, 2, 3. You guys know it. What is it? Psalms 23. He makes me lie down. He leads my head by still waters. He restores my soul. What's that saying? God is leading you and I to a place of rest. He's leading you and I to, he's saying, come on, get some rest so that you can be restored. How many here say amen to that? Amen. All right, but you just can't say amen. We got to make some changes, okay? So look at your week. And if everything's important, then nothing really is. Look at your week and reprioritize some things. And get the rest that you need. Get the rest that you need. Amen. Number two, the second thing that God told him to do, this is going to be shocking, release your burdens. God told him to release his burdens. So the first one was the physical exhaustion. This one is emotional exhaustion. And God told him, release your burdens. Listen, on the screen, revealing your feelings is the beginning of healing. I used to do hip-hop. You like that? <laughs> revealing your feelings is the beginning of healing. 
Now, it doesn't say wait till you explode and reveal the feelings. But talk to God about it. What is it you're going through? And for some weird reason, we live in a generation in which we feel we can't come to God and just tell him exactly how we feel. Let me give you a newsflash. I learned this the moment I got born again. God is all-knowing. He already knows how you feel. So you telling him isn't for him. You telling him is for you. You got to release how you feel and you got to tell God. Some of us may need one or two people in our lives that we can tell how we feel. But not one or two people that are going through the same exact thing you're going through. But people who are mature that can give you a different perspective. And help listen and lead you. Are you with me? Any area of life that you can't talk about is out of control. Any area of life that you can't talk about controls you. I don't, I don't want to talk about I just don't want to talk about that. You keep it bottled. Oh, no, no, no. I already gave it to God. If it's still burning in you, you didn't give it to God. You buried it. It wasn't crucified. And what happens is eventually it comes back up again in moments of lack of sleep amongst other situations and events. We have to learn to give it to, give it to God, to tell him exactly how we feel. Release our burdens. Release our frustrations. Don't start complaining to other people. Start talking to God. Let God know. And I'm telling you, he's got pretty broad shoulders. If he carried the weight of the world on his shoulder that day on Golgotha's cross, I'm sure he can carry some of our little whining and complaining. Just tell him, God, I'm mad. I'm mad right now, God. Just tell him how you feel. Look at 1 Kings 19, 19. I got to make it biblical. This is what Elijah did. Then he went into the cave and he spent the night. God said, what are you doing here? What's God asking him? Elijah, what's happening? God said, Elijah, what are you doing? Come on. Does God not know the answer to this question? Of course he does. This is not for God. This is for Elijah. Elijah, what's happening? How'd you get here? We, you had a Mount Carmel experience, you saw what I did over there, and now you're here in this place of exhaust. How'd you get here? Talk to me. What's going on? What does Elijah respond? I have been very zealous for the Lord, but, you catch that? Man, I love you, God. I got, you know, I'm passionate about you, Lord. You know I do. I go to church on Sundays. I go to small group. I read my Bible. You know everything I do. I'm passionate for you, God, but, and that's what God wanted. But what? Come on. What are you doing here? Tell me. And he begins to talk, he begins to explain. I've been living for you. I've been, I've been doing all the things you told me to do. I've gone to preach what you've told me to go preach. I've stepped out in faith. I've been following your plan for my life, but he begins to unload in the following verse. What does he tell God? He tells him six things, in fact. Six things, God. I'm afraid. I'm bitter. I'm angry. I'm lonely. I'm worried. And on top of all that, I am depressed. Read your scripture. Six things he complains to God about. No wonder he's dealing with emotional fatigue and exhaustion. He has all these feelings, all these emotions, all these thoughts bottled up inside. Eventually, when the pressure begins to build, you own an old school pressure cooker. When the pressure begins to build, and it... You guys remember the old school pressure cooker who's had... Right, they're fantastic. My mom used to have one of those. And she would always, always open them like this. But what's that sound? What's happening? The pressure cooker is slowly releasing the pressure. Because if it doesn't, it will explode. We have to release the pressure. And who better to release it with than God? The one who has all the answers the one who can help, the one who can lift us up, the one who can fill up our tank in times of emptiness. And Elijah says, I'm going through all of this. When's the last time you did that? Oh, no, but that makes me weak. Oh, no, that, that, that means I, I, I lack faith. When's the last time you've gone to God? I said, God, yes, I do. I lack faith. God, I am mad. God, I thought you said this, but this is what's happening in my life. God, I trusted your promise, and here I am. When's the last time you came to God and just let him know? God wants you to cast your cares upon who? Him. He says, cast your cares upon me. Give it to me. Let me know what they are. Again, not for him, for you. We try to put up a face sometimes, don't we? Especially if you're in a position of leadership or, or you're in a position of high responsibility or high expectations. We just try to muscle our way through. 
and we try to put on this face. But eventually, if you don't talk about it, eventually you're going to explode. And it comes out in moments of rage, frustration, and then later on you have to apologize to everybody. I've been there. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? I had one last week. I've been there. You got to be able to let go and give God your burdens. If you don't talk it out, you're going to take it out on someone. It will happen. It will happen. God wasn't shocked that Elijah was complaining. God wasn't shocked that Elijah felt this way. God wasn't shocked when he said, God, I'm angry and I'm bitter and I'm depressed and I'm lonely. God wasn't surprised. God didn't say, well, you shouldn't feel that way. You need to change. What did God do? He listened. And I, I, I realize this about God. God will listen until we have no more words to say. He just listened. He's a good father. He's a good daddy. He'll just listen until you have nothing else to say. When you look at Psalms, I, some of you might be shocked, but have you ever, I have a whole list of them, I'm not going to go over them, but have any of you ever read Psalms 58? You read it one day, and I read, I'm thinking to myself, I can't believe this is in the Bible. And it's actually David. And David is sprouting off at God, he's frustrated, he's just, he's running on empty. And some of the things he tells God, in example, he says, God, I hate my enemies, I can't stand them. God, I want to see them all dead. It goes further. Slaughter their whole family and generation. I don't care. God, I want to kick them in the teeth. This ain't me. This is the Bible. This is in Scripture. I remember reading it thinking to myself, Lord, that's violent and aggressive. But God leaves it. David, a man after God's own heart. David, the one chosen in which God would bring his son, Jesus, through an eternal throne that will have no end. This is David spouting off at God, low energy, emotionally frustrated. He is tired, running on empty, and he begins to say some stuff. You guys ever been there? Where the guy's like, man, God, take him out. Take him out, Lord. I'm done with this. Do what you got to do, Lord. Let lightning from heaven... And you find this in scripture. David does this. He was blowing off some steam. And God let him talk. But then later God brings instruction. There is no emotion, church, you cannot express to God. There is no emotion. You can come to him like a child. And you can tell him how you feel. Cast your cares upon him. You know what the word cast means? It doesn't even mean to gently place. It means to fling it. To throw it. That's, that's what God's telling you to do. He's saying, don't be gentle with it. Don't, don't take your time with it. Throw it at me. That's what the scripture says. Fling it at me. Just toss it. Because God cares that he knows the longer you hold on to that, the worse it's going to get. You got to give it up. Is that good? I'm being very practical today. That's one of the reasons we emphasize um, like small groups, for example. You can't talk about everything in small groups, but a small group provides a little of the a little opportunity to speak and talk about some things that are happening. That's what happened to our Timothy team. It just everybody's in tears. We begin to talk, and they all look so much better today. Just letting go of some things and giving it to God. Don't be afraid to do that. But make sure when it's done, it's done with people who are mature in the faith. People who can help you. Not just those who are going to contribute to your frustration. All right, where am I at, guys? Number three. All right, here we go. Number three. Refocus on God. So get some rest. Tell God how you feel. Give your burdens to him. Cast it. Just be honest with him. Number three. Refocus on God. The first one was... 
Which one? Physical. The second one is emotional. This one is spiritual. Refocus on God. We got to get a new perspective. In order to do that, we have to readjust our focus from the stuff and the situation and keep it back on God. First Kings 19.11, it reads this, God, sorry, go out and stand before me on the mountain. This is God speaking to Elijah. The Lord told him. So what's happening to your pastor mom? After all this, God tells him, hey, come out of that cave. Come out of that dark place you're in for a moment. Come out. I want to show you something. And he stands. He goes, look at the mountain. And you know what God begins to do? The, one of the most greatest pyrotechnic shows of all time. God begins to bring a wind so powerful that he begins to crack the mountains before Elijah. Now think about that for a moment. You're standing there and a wind comes and the mountains begin to break in half. That's pretty powerful. But at the end of all that, the scripture says, but God wasn't there. And then that's over. And then what does God do? What, does he, what else does he bring? He brings an earthquake. The earth begins to shake. The mountains begin to rumble. The sound is like a freight train. He's seeing all this. Whoa, look, look what's happening. And the Bible says, but God cannot be seen there. What? Then comes the third thing after that. What was it? Fire. Good job. Fire from heaven, which he saw earlier. Fire is coming down. It's a big firestorm. He's looking at this. And the scriptures, but God was not seen there. And the fourth thing that happened, God whispers. And there is where God was found by him. What's he saying? We live our lives... Elijah just had amazing miracles, big things happen. And we live our lives thinking if the big shabam is not happening, then God's not here. We live our lives thinking that God is only in those big, that God is not in the mundane, that God is not in the everyday in, day outs. I feel so alone, God. God, where have you gone? Because if I don't see the big explosions in my life, then you're not there. God says, no. It's not about the big moments. It's not about the big show. It's about my voice. It's about my presence. It's about my whisper. And he's telling Elijah, listen to my voice and stop listening to yours. Listen to my whisper. And a whisper is important because it's not loud. It's a whisper. And in order for you to hear a whisper, you are leaning in. You are committed to leaning in to hear a whisper. And he's telling him, come here, get closer. I'm whispering. Get closer to me. Get closer to my presence. See, stop looking at your life and thinking to myself, look what's happening in your life. God, how come you're not doing it in mine? God is in their life, but surely he ain't in mine because look what I'm going through. God says the fire, the earthquake, the winds, I will not be seen there. I will be found by you in the intimate moments, the whisper, the one-on-one -on -one time with me. It is that moment of presence that you will hear me. God's saying, refocus, come to me. Come back to the place of intimacy. I know, Elijah, you're wanting another Carmel experience, but I'm here right now. I'm here now. I want to talk to you. I want to speak to you. Listen to my gentle whisper because it is in that place where true strength comes from. It's in that place you get refilled. It's in the place of intimacy. God's whisper in the wilderness brings strength for our journey. And you might feel like you're in a wilderness time right now, but it's his whisper, it's his presence, it's his voice that's going to give you strength for your journey. And if you're feeling emotionally drained, stop with the big stuff. Go back to the basics of our relationship with him. Go back to his voice, the place of intimacy, the alone times in your room. How many of you spend a lot of time with God in the shower? I do. I thought I was the only one. Hey, hermano. I go in the shower. I mean, I watch TV in there sometimes too. I'm not going to lie. But there are moments in the shower. I'm just showering and the water's running. My eyes are closed. And I'm just spending some time with him. It's just a one-on-one -on -one moment away from all the kids, away from the television, the noise. Just one-on-one. -on -one. Find your place, church. Find your place. Find your daily moment to spend time with him. Incline your ear to his whisper. Spend time with the, in the presence of God. Because spiritual exhaustion will always meet healing in the whisper of God's love. Spiritual exhaustion will always meet healing in the whisper of God's love. What we want to do when we're tired is pull away from everything and everyone. 
But what God is saying is stay close to me. Don't pull away from me. Because I am the only answer to your empty gas tank. I can fill you up. And the last one, and I'm done. Is this helpful so far? Yeah. It's practical and it's stuff that we know, but, but the last one is the calling. After all these, God says, good. Resume your call. Can you put an R after the U there, Patty, just for my, my sake? Resume your calling. People are taking pictures. I want to make sure we're good. I see you guys with the iPad. Don't post that. There, boom, Patty. You're all right, Patty. You're all right. Ah. Re resume your calling. What does that mean? You got your rest. You need it. Cast your cares upon me. Let, you got to release your burdens. You need to. What was the third one? Refocus on me. Come back to me. Get your attention off of the stuff and just come back to me for a moment because you need me. But after we've done that, there is a moment in time after these steps are taken that God says, now get up and renew your call. In other words, God takes us from a place where we stop just focusing on ourselves and we begin to focus on others. We begin to think about others. I know when you're in pain, because I, I get there often, all you can see is yourself. But if you look around for a moment, I assure you, you're going to find someone in greater pain than you. If you just for a moment look up and look around, you're going to find somebody who's going through something much greater. Get your rest. Get healed. Find your strength. But don't stay there. Because self-awareness is not where it ends. Being introspective is not where it ends. God after says, now rise up and continue to serve me by loving people, by serving people, because people are hurting. First Kings 19.15, what did he tell Elijah? Now, Elijah, go back the way you came to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel and Jehu and Elisha. What's he telling him? He says, listen, you've been tired. You've been running on E, but now you're refreshed. And now that you are, get up. Go back where you came from. Anoint these men and you will serve again in the context of community. You're no longer going to feel alone. You're going to serve with other brothers or sisters in the faith. I have called you. Keep running the race. Keep fighting the good fight. God gives Elijah a brand new assignment to help him fully get out of the funk that he is in. He wanted Elijah to realize that he was not through with him. And today you might be going through some stuff. Get your rest. Get your what you need. But don't ever forget in that process that God is not finished with you yet. There's so great things that God has for you there's a great purpose upon your life and there is an assignment. And if you really want to get out of the place you're in, that is your last step. To shake the dust off and continue your call. Continue what God has called you to do. God brought you to impact today and last week to hear this message. He loves you. He cares for you. And he will never leave you where he's found you. But whatever you do, don't quit. My last point on the screen, the quickest way to defeat exhaustion is to get your eyes off yourself and start focusing on helping others. And Jesus said, in giving your life away, you will find it. So there comes a time when you get what you need, you get back up again and you move forward. Who can testify that you've been there at one moment of your life, right? And then eventually you get to the point where it's the last step. Because, you know, you can get real comfortable, too, in the retreat. You can get real comfortable, too, in just the focusing on, on yourself. You can stay in that hole for a long time. And the next, that last phase where God says, come on, get up now. And let's move forward. And I've been there before where I don't feel like getting out of bed. I've been there before where I'm just tired. 
Remember last week I said you feel like living off the grid? Remember I said that? Have those crossed my mind too? I wouldn't do it because where else will I go? Who else has the words of life, right? But you're all those moments you just feel like turning off your phone, getting off the grid, disconnecting everything and going away and never, ever, ever to be seen or found again. I have been there. I'm not immune to this stuff. You're not the only one going through things. I go through things constantly. The weight and the pressure is hard. But I'm going to tell you, he's greater. He's faithful. He is so good. He's never left you, nor he ever will forsake you. He is there. He's a good daddy. He's a good father. And he has fresh and renewed strength for you today. He has fresh and renewed purpose for you right now, today. You don't have to stay in the place that you're in today. He hears you. He's not mad at you. He loves you. And he's waiting with open arms to strengthen you, to lift you up, and to launch you into purpose. Can you just stand with me this morning? Is that all right? Can you just lift up your hands for a moment, Father? We just thank you, Daddy. We thank you, Lord God, because we're not alone. We know that your word says that our heart is deceitful above all things. Our emotions can deceive us. Our feelings can deceive us. And some of us find ourselves in that place right now. We have been or we will be. But Father, today we stand not on our emotions. We stand on the truth of your word today. That you love us. We're not forsaken. We have not been abandoned. We do have a high priest that's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. We can approach the throne room of grace in our time of need. Oh, Father, in the place of pain and hurt, you are the bond of Gilead. You are our healer. When we feel we have no strength, you are our strong tower, Lord God. When we feel we can't take it anymore, you're our shield of faith, Lord God. And we just thank you this morning for your love. Oh, Abba, we thank you for your love today. And Father, we prescribe to what you've spoken today. We will find time to rest. We will be open with you, Lord God. I no longer try to hide as Adam and Eve did in the cool of the day. We will tell you exactly what it is we feel. We will lay it upon your shoulder because we know you love us and you care. Father, we will give it all, Lord God. We will give everything. And we will say yes to your call. We will say yes to your leading because we have identified and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are not done with us yet. That there is more, 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 more. That we are more than conquerors in you. We thank you, Lord God, that no weapon formed against us will prevail or prosper. We thank you, Lord God, that you care. And so, Father, we declare over Impact Church today, get your rest. Get your rest. Be refilled because great is the assignment upon your life and upon this church. Because hundreds and thousands of people in this city are waiting for a healthy church to come forth. So get your rest because God is not through with you yet. Father, we thank you today. In Jesus' mighty name, the people of God said, amen. amen and amen. I was supposed to call up Pastor Maritza to close out in prayer, but I got emotional, you know. Can you lead us in prayer today? We're just going to say amen to that, right? We're going to say amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And the, and the house says? Amen.